who had to validate and justify locking up prisoners and keeping people in prison, uh, stating that they was the worst of the worst, and so they had to create these conditions to make people think that they were the worst of the worst. Put them in a position and indoctrinate them into believing that they are the worst of the worst, and then eventually they they can act like that, like they are the worst of the worst. I see themselves as being the worst of the worst, and that they are unworthy. So it's it's demoralizing, it's the it's the, the humanizing, and it's uh, humiliating. Let me add to that because I think we have someone here who, who, who really broke this pattern and that's King. Um, first of all, King spent 29 years in isolation, which is extraordinary, and he came out very healthy. And I think it had a lot to do with his vision and his political consciousness and his knowledge that there was a movement behind him out in the world, that people were protesting this kind of treatment in prison. A lot of people don't have that. And what the system wants is for prisoners to be passive and silent. Isolation is a part of that. Um, they did an experiment at Stanford, the mock uh, prison experiment, in the basement of the psychology department in the early 70s, and it's called the Stanford Mock Prison Experiment. And what they did is they made one group of, of students, they picked Stanford students to be guards and to be prisoners and to act as guards and prisoners and they gave the guards the keys to the rooms and, and the food to pass out, and they put the prisoners inside rooms with prison guard. And the, the experiment was supposed to go on for two weeks or more, and they had to stop it after a couple of days because the guards became so sadistic and brutal towards the prisoners that the experimenters had to be called to stop the experiment. Uh, Craig Haney, who was the principal investigator, along with Philip Zimbardo in that experiment, says that what's the prerequisite to that kind of sadism is having one group in total control of the, another group and have the group that's under their control have no recourse, no ability to protest. I think there's a third prerequisite, and that is that the whole thing occur in secrecy. That is, if you're going to abuse people, you don't want them to have a public airing of their complaints about the abuse. So there is a concerted effort on the part of correctional authorities to close off communication with the prisons. Getting back to the segregation unit that King was in, here you've got three Black Panthers there who are saying, you're trying to tell us that we're the worst of the worst. We don't believe you. We think that there's another thing going on here, that you're throwing African-American men into prison, and it has something to do with racism in this country and class inequity and such. And they were teaching the other prisoners that. That's what frightened the authorities. So what they want to do is isolate prisoners from each other, isolate prisoners from their loved ones, because visiting and loved ones making contact is how we know what's going on in the prisons. They don't tell us what's going on. But having your family visit, so they made visiting harder and harder. They put the prisons way out far from the urban centers where the prisoners come from, so the family has a hard time making the trip. They put rules on the, on the visitors. They can only visit for an hour. It has to be through glass instead of in person. And the media is barred. In California, we have a gag rule that the media cannot interview prisoners without the permission of the Department of Corrections. All of these things keep what's going on inside prison secret. And then the abuses multiply. When I said there was a historic wrong turn in the 80s, what they should have done is resolved the crowding and gone back to the population they earlier had, for instance, to halt the putting people with low-level drug offenses in prison. It does them no good. There's no reason to put them in prison except for to build the prison population. They should have reversed that, and they should have reinstated rehabilitation because rehabilitation works and prepares people for after they get released. They didn't do that. Instead, they put more and more people in segregation. The brutality mounted. And the, for instance, the cell extractions, which is every time you need to move someone in a, in, in a segregation cell, and they say, no, I don't want to be moved. They put together a squad of officers, and they come in with plastic shields, and you know, I call them ice hockey outfits. They have padding all over them. And they slam the prisoner into the wall, and usually there's a lot of injuries. Well, that goes on on an almost daily basis in these units. When you treat people like that, first of all, it really destroys the people. If they don't have a political consciousness, they think, well, I'm being treated terribly, I must be a terrible person, and they start to lose their self-esteem. 
But the other thing that happens is that if the news of that got out to the public, the public would be horrified. So what do they do? They restrict the visits. They keep the prisoners separated so they can't talk to each other. So King and the others of the, of the Angola Three cannot explain to other prisoners what's going on and help them have the vision and hope for the future. They're silenced with each other. Visitors are restricted. The media can't get in. And that's how the sadism continues. Um, now, yeah. you know more about this in, in reality. I'm telling yeah, you well, the theory, which yeah, I have um, lived. Um, that way you, you initially started uh, put, you know, people in, you know, where they isolate uh, prisoners and use the prisoners to, to maintain Angola, you know, to maintain prisoners. Angola is a prime example of that. That way inmate guards that. That was, that was an inmate guard system, as you know, for years and years and years. And these inmates had the power of life and death over other inmates. They participated in the brutality of inmates and the raping and selling of other young inmates um, um, to prison population. Um, if an inmate tried to escape, um, and I am telling you, some of those inmate guards, they were worse than the so-called, what we call free people. Uh, because it almost as if there was um, the flip side, the negative side of what, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the so-called free people would do. A prisoner against another prisoner, the inhumanity of one prisoner against another one is magnified in prison when you use that type of system, um, you know, to, to you create a system where an uh, inmate, you know, uh, kind of run, uh, run the prison themselves. They kind of uh, judge, gauge their own behavior, uh, keep, keep in check another prisoner. And so um, uh, this lasted for a period of time, for a while. And to a great, uh, uh, to, 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 to an extent, these kind of things still, uh, still goes on because you have tiers, uh, even in Angola. Angola is considered a maximum security prison. But you have, um, you have, when I say tiers, you have tiers of, of statuses, you know, because within this maximum security, they have people believing that they are trustees, which is really you know, impossible. But they do have people <coughs> believing that there's a so-called trustee side and there's a medium custody. And, uh, the, you know, to validate this in the mind of the prisoner, they are, they are allowed to have more, more privileges than people who are in uh, other areas who are in so-called isolation. Um, they kind of make it seem as if uh, you, um, I look at prison and you look at prison as a uh, maximum security prison as entire isolation of the entire uh, prison population. On the other hand, prison within this confine do not see themselves because their status is they allow them to have certain privileges that they don't let others. And as a result of that, this, so it is still, it, to a great degree, uh, it still they still maintain the fact that they use other prisoners to keep other prisoners in line because if I'm here, you are at the bottom of the way of how you look at it. Um, I'm, if I'm at the top of security, I'm at the bottom of high of security. Uh, if there's another individual who is less, you know, in a less restrictive area that's getting more quote privileges than I am, my the idea is to make me aspire to be the same as this prisoner getting these uh, privileges. And World Kane of Warner of Angola has I, I did, he have implemented a policy of religion. And based on religion, I mean he have implemented built churches uh, all over Angola, uh, different types of churches. And he maintains uh, he maintains control, you know, he allows certain prisoners to do certain organization uh, to, to, to run these and I use that in quotation, run these organizations to be in position to do certain things, to acquire certain things. And and if any and if for if they would send a person like me, even though you know I was the, considered, if you really want to see, and I don't like to use that term, mild prison. Uh, if they would have sent me in population after a period of time, those same individuals who had those privileges, there would have been so many complaints from other prisons that I was going to come down and disrupt, you know, and cause some type of disunity. And as a result of that, they would scoop me back up and place me right back in population. But these are the type of things that goes on and it perpetuates, goes on and on and on. So to some degree, the controlling of inmates is 
you know, there are many ways that inmates can be, they allow the, the most other inmates to control inmates, uh, inmates control themselves, and then the administration control inmates. And you got, you know, um, a level of, of control that is inhuman.